Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I welcome you, all of you, to Subsidy 2 uh, Farm and Ecosystem Level Benefits, Conservation Agriculture Systems to Farmers, Society and Environment. I will be chairing this sub-team uh, with uh, Rob Milovic, rapporteur. Um, I'll introduce myself. I am uh, from, Portuguese, from Portugal. I am a farmer and uh, I chair the Portuguese Association for Conservation uh, Agriculture. We will start um, with a keynote speech uh, with uh, Don uh, Rekoski. Uh, Don Rekoski uh, needs no introdu introduction. Everybody knows him. Um, I'm very grateful to, to him because I've learned a lot of things uh, from his experience. Uh, he's a retired soil scientist from the uh, United States ARS, North Central Soil Conservation Research Laboratory. And he's an adjunct professor in the Soil, Water and Climate Department, University of Minnesota. His basic research in soil and water conservation uh, for 42 years emphasized carbon cycling, carbon management and tillage impacts. Go on, Don. Hello. Well, good day, everyone. Today, I'm honored to be here to talk to you about conservation agriculture and ecosystem services. I'd first like to thank the organizers for the opportunity, and I'm truly grateful for that, and hope that you will have a better understanding about the living soil and ecosystem services. Nature is our friend providing food security. Nature provides our resources, that is the sun, the soil, the water, the air, our human intellect and biodiversity. And so nature provides the biopower in our living soils. And the living soil is what starts our food chain. It's so important that we understand the role of carbon in this food chain. Nature's biological power is in the soil. It's composed of the little microbes and the fungi and the soil fauna that do all of the nutrient cycling and carbon cycling for us. Even though they are out of sight, they are not out of mind, and they're very important to us in our agricultural production systems. And we have to think, start thinking more about biological components in our agricultural production systems. Humans obtain more than 99.7% of their food calories from the land, according to Pimitel. So caring for soils is caring for life. Caring for living soils is really caring for human life. We can start off by looking at the biogenic carbon cycle, which starts with photosynthesis, bringing CO2 and water to form the carbohydrates and plus some oxygen. This converts the solar energy to biochemical energy, and that energy is captured in the form of the carbohydrates that we utilize. If we take a look at the reverse of that process, taking the oxidation of the carbohydrates, it releases energy for us to enable us to do useful work. While I represent this as a relatively simple cycle, I assure you that's very, very complex and the devil's in the details. I think most of us understand that the main source of our food and energy generation comes from the plant and this process of photosynthesis. We take a little bit of a broader look at carbon energy flow through the soil plant atmosphere system. And again, it starts with photosynthesis, bringing together the carbon dioxide and the water that results in the carbohydrates that then form other compounds that move down the stem to the plant roots and out of the roots as exudates, feeding the microbes and soil fauna. Some of that carbon goes through nutrient cycling, plant nutrition and food nutrition, and a portion of that goes through the typical carbon cycling and for ecosystem services. And because I need three meals a day, I'm interested in the food, feed, fiber, and fuel component of this energy flow path. And so when we take our food and utilize it, and through the process of respiration, digesting that food, 
carbon dioxide is released to go back into the atmosphere and back into this carbon energy flow that we are working with to manage appropriately. And so this is an enhanced view of the, of the carbon cycling, but we also have to start thinking about carbon energy flow throughing, flowing through the soil plant atmosphere system. Carbon is an integral component of every life form on earth. And that should get your attention, I think. I use this quote from a no-till farmer in South Dakota who states that carbon is the framework and the fuel of every living thing. That should get you to thinking that carbon is pretty important in our agriculture production systems. So we must manage carbon in harmony with nature to optimize our ecosystem services. From my perspective, carbon is the backbone of agriculture. Carbon is captured in photosynthesis utilizing nature's free energy. Carbon exudates from the plant roots feed the soil biology. Carbon into biomass also feeds the soil biology. The biomass protects against soil erosion. The carbon increases nutrient cycling, soil structure, infiltration, water holding capacity, water use efficiency, the carbon enhances soil health and human health and these ecosystem services that we are talking about. And from my perspective, carbon is that capital C that starts conservation. Well, the point that I want you to understand that's analogous to your backbone, each of those individual vertebrae are connected and connected in such a way that you, the back is one of the strongest portions of our body that allows us to carry out many of our life activities. And so if you think about the backbone as connected vertebrae, I want you to think about carbon as the backbone of agriculture because carbon is connected to itself and to many other different nutrients, nutrient elements. Carbon is unique in that it combines with a large variety of atoms to form an even larger variety of compounds. The carbon to carbon bonds can be a single bond or a double bond or a triple bond. But of more importance, I think, is the carbon to the other nutrient elements that are important. <clears throat> carbon can be connected to the hydrogen, the nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, plus about 23 other <clears throat> mineral nutrients that are utilized and required by plant growth. This ability to connect with these elements found in organic molecules contributes to the basic simple simplicity that's underlying all life on earth. And so this ability to connect with these other elements and in terms of carbon connection provides opportunities for diversity. This ability to connect enables the formation of millions and millions of a diverse organic compounds that are very valuable in providing our ecosystem services. So the connection capability of carbon is important to us. Now looking at the ecosystems, we can start off with some Simplified definition. Ecology is a branch of biology that deals with the relationships between the organisms to one another <clears throat> and to their physical surroundings. An ecosystem is a community of living organisms interacting with each other and their non-living environment. And we as humans are part of that ecosystem community. The ecosystem services are the many and varied benefits to humans provided by the natural resources and the environment in the form of healthy ecosystems. And ecosystem services can be considered nature's gift and contribution to humanity. So with this little bit of understanding, we'll dig in, into more detail about ecosystem services. I use this quote from Klaus Topper, who states that ecosystems and the services they provide are financially significant and to degrade and damage them is tantamount to economic suicide. And I might add, not to say anything about environmental suicide. So ec ecosystem services are important to us. Ecosystems are complicated and are characterized by the interacting geological, hydrological, climatological, ecological, and anthropogenic processes. And there are strong interactions between these processes and the components of them that requires a systems approach to understand the response to dynamic changes. 
And to show the importance of that, <clears throat> I use this quote from Rattan Lau from Ohio State University, who states that soil organic matter generates and regulates every ecosystem service that sustains life on Earth. Think about it, that's a pretty powerful statement. And it's important enough that I'm gonna repeat it again for emphasis. Soil organic matter generates and regulates every ecosystem service that sustains life on Earth. And so I hope you are beginning to appreciate the role of carbon in maintaining our ecosystem services. When we take a look at the system, we have this stairway of uh, events and opportunities leading to the definition of ecosystem services. It starts with the living soil, goes through some of the natural resources, ecology, through our definition of ecosystem and ecosystem services. I want you to understand that this stairway to these ecosystem services is found on a, based on a foundation of soil carbon. That's the primary energy source for the living soil system. So we get these invisible dynamic services that result in visible outcomes in terms of improved structure, improved infiltration, and all the other things that happen in that system that's very important to us. So we don't necessarily see any of this activity taking place below the soil surface, but we have to understand that these invisible dynamic forces are doing a lot of work for us that result in visible and important, criti critically important outcomes. The scientific community has came up with a definition and grouping of ecosystem services. And I just added the word living soils because that's of, what's of interest to us today. The community has come up with these four groups, the provisioning, the supporting, the regulating, and the cultural ecosystem services. From my perspective, agriculture contributes directly to the first three, that is the provisioning, the supporting, and the regulating of ecosystem services. Agriculture also contributes indirectly to the cultural ecosystem services like recreation and social relations and aesthetic values. It can say indirectly because those cultural ecosystem services wouldn't be there if they did not have three meals a day to support their life's activities. So from my perspective, agriculture contributes to all four categories of ecosystem services with the main emphasis on provisioning, supporting, and regulation, and then indirect effects on the culture because it provides society with three meals a day. So I hope you get the point that these ecosystem services are important because they are in the vicinity of the carbon cycle shown in this schematic that uh, should point, to the point, point out the importance of carbon in the, these ecosystem services. So now if we take a look at the conservation agriculture systems with the three primary principles of minimum soil disturbance, permanent vegetative cover, and species biodiversification that form the three primary principles or pillars, they support these four groups of ecosystem services. That is the provisioning, the supporting, the regulating, and the cultural. And they do this in proximity to the carbon cycle that I think is very important to us. And so with conservation agriculture systems, we are going to be able to address all four groups of ecosystem services, especially in our agricultural ecosystems. So conservation agriculture, I think is pretty important to us in maintaining these ecosystem services. So now it's time to switch gears a little bit and talk about tillage induced carbon dioxide loss. From my perspective, this is the number one environmental enemy in production agriculture because intensive tillage promotes the soil organic matter oxidation and soil de degradation. And you can see the flickering flames on the left that represent the slow burning, the slow oxidation of the carbon that goes out of the system as CO2 into the atmosphere. And we found that the intensive tillage with intensive tillage, the amount of CO2 that goes out is proportional to the volume of soil disturbed. So all of the soil degradation that we're seeing from my perspective is directly related to intensive tillage. So with conventional intensive tillage over the last 10,000 years in our, our societies, conventional tillage has done some damage to the soils and they have contributed to the climate crisis by releasing carbon to the atmosphere. So conventional tillage 
has been farming our way into the climate crisis because of the maximum soil disturbance and the carbon loss from the soil ending up in the atmosphere. But now we have the opportunity with conservation agriculture systems of farming our way out of the climate crisis by using minimum soil disturbance and direct seeding. And so while agriculture has made some contribution to the climate issues, we now have a real opportunity to help mitigate some of those climate change by getting conservation agriculture systems applied around the world on all agricultural landscapes. So with conventional intensive tillage, we've unbalanced mother nature. And now with conservation agriculture systems, I think we can rebalance uh, nature and bring it back to a near normal situation. With intensive tillage, we end up with too little carbon in the soil and too much carbon in the air. So our challenge in agriculture now is to decarbonize the air and recarbonize the soil so that we can bring that back into balance. And I'm convinced that conservation agriculture will allow us to do that, increasing our productivity and maintaining environmental quality as a result of rebalancing nature in our agricultural production systems. This rebalancing results in enhanced soil properties for enhanced soil health. The properties and processes were grouped into biological, physical, and chemical processes. But I want you to understand that all these interact and are coordinated through the carbon cycle that results in enhanced soil health. Healthy soil grows healthy food, which we want. And soil carbon fuels this soil health enhancement that's important to all of us. So we want to manage those groups of soil physical properties and processes to enhance soil health, which requires enhanced carbon management. Intensive tillage also destroys soil structure. And so we need to understand why soil structure is so important to us. And when we look at a soil, we talk about soil aggregates. And I think we should be talking about soil nuggets that are analogous to gold nuggets that are very valuable to us that become, when we put them into the treasure box, <clears throat> it becomes important and meaningful to us in terms of economic value. Well, our true treasure in the soil is the living microbiome with all the microbes and the fungi <clears throat> and other insects in the soil that are doing this, um, working as, as workers in our factory, cycling carbon, cycling the nutrients, and resulting in enhanced production. And so the biological power of this microbiome needs energy in the form of carbon. And this is so valuable to us that I think we should be calling them soil nuggets instead of soil aggregates. So when we look at <clears throat> what good soil structure does in the living soil, it provides habitat for the microbes and the fauna. It provides aeration and oxygen exchange that's important. It provides enhanced water infiltration. It provides decreased runoff and erosion. It provides enhanced bio four uh, networking and uh, expansion of the network. It also enables deeper rooting. The soil structure enhances carbon storage, water storage, water availability, water use efficiency, ecosystem services, nutrient cycling and availability. And what more can you ask from the soil if it's doing all of these things for us as a result of good soil structure? And the only way we get good soil structure is to not till the soil and let mother nature take care of helping form this physical parameters that are important to us, just like you see in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. So from my perspective, plant carbon is our greatest water management tool. And I've already told you a little bit about what carbon increases in terms of some of these processes. Carbon increases the soil biological activity. It can increase the water quality, increase the root and worm biopores, nutrient cycling and drainage. Well, carbon also decreases soil runoff, erosion, evaporation, sediments, temperature, soil crusting, soil pollution, compaction and desertification. So it does a lot of things for us. And so we look at carbon as any type of live or dead 
plant material or microbial material that's in the soil that contributes to the soil organic matter and as a primary component of carbon. So from my perspective, good carbon management is required for an enhanced increase in water use efficiency that's important to us, uh, especially during dry years. So we can look at this stairway to enhance water use efficiency that starts with the invisible characters and processes in the living soil. The microorganisms are operating, and we have some carbon capture that improves nutrient cycling, improves soil structure and infiltration <clears throat> that results in increased water use efficiency. And so we have these invisible processes that enable visible outcomes in terms of water use efficiency and limited uh, runoff with good conservation systems. And so it's important that we understand the role of the living uh, biology in these processes that are taking, taking place in the living soil. Another way to look at this <clears throat> is comparing the water use efficiency for conventional ag versus conservation agriculture system. When we look at the hydrologic processes, we can see some differences. So if we take a look at the evaporation and conservation agriculture represented by the blue arrows and conventional tillage agriculture represented by the yellow arrows, <clears throat> with a larger arrow for evaporation, there's more evaporation from the conventional tillage system that goes into the atmosphere and is of little use to the soil plant atmosphere systems. But if we look at the process of transpiration, the blue arrow is the largest, so we get more water going through the plant and it's more useful and helpful to the soil plant atmosphere system. If we look at the infiltration, we get more infiltration with the conservation ag system, less runoff with the conservation ag system. We get more and larger biopores with the conservation agriculture system that results in more total water storage deeper into the profile. And we also get more plant available water with the increase in the soil carbon sponge effect that holds the water available for the plants as the start, soil starts to dry out. So when we look at this comparison between conventional tillage agriculture and conservation agriculture systems, I think you can see that the water use efficiency is much greater with conservation agriculture system with no soil disturbance than it is with intensive tillage agriculture. <clears throat> so in working with mother nature to improve soil health, we have to do some thinking. And I use this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. It states that as to methods, there may be a million and then some, but the principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own method. And from my perspective, conservation agriculture is nature's way. We have continuous minimum soil disturbance, maximum vegetative cover, and maximum maintenance of biodiversity. Conservation agriculture is nature's way. I think conservation agriculture systems are carbon-centered agriculture. These systems result in healthy food, affordable, they're profitable, they're environmentally friendly, and our regenerative solution to our food security. And so understanding nature's biopower is important for us in understanding the outputs of conservation agriculture system. We mentioned the importance of the biopower in the living soil a little earlier in this presentation. So again, looking at the system, we can look at this gear network, again, made up of the three primary principles of minimum soil disturbance, permanent vegetative cover and species diversification that are all integrated and working around the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is driving all three of these primary principles that results in some synchrony in the system and biodiversity maintenance. We also get synergistic benefits and it shows that we are working in harmony with nature. So conservation agriculture system with these three principles being carbon centered is very important to us in maintaining our food security. If we take a further look at into this in depth, you recall that I mentioned earlier that carbon was the backbone of agriculture. And when you have all those carbon elements connected to each other as the backbone is, feeding into this conservation agriculture system and network of processing some of that carbon, we end up with 
the four categories of the ecosystem services that are important to us. And I can list them individually, but I list the four groups here as the provisioning, the supporting, the regulating, and the cultural ecosystem services. And these are provided as a result of the efficiencies and the uh, synchronies and the, the synergistic benefits that occur in our conservation agriculture systems. We can look at that carbon going through the system resulting in that. And an analogy is this wagon wheel with the axle of that wagon wheel being carbon. The hub of that axle is conservation agriculture systems. And out of that hub comes individual spokes that represent individual benefits for the ecosystem services. And the more spokes we have in that wheel, the stronger the wheel is in terms of providing these services. <clears throat> and so, as I indicated, I need three meals a day. And so the food I put at the top of the list, but there are many other benefits that come out of conservation agriculture systems, like climate regulation, nutrient cycling, habitat for the organisms, erosion control, flood mitigation, biodiversity, water purification, pollinator habitat, carbon capture and cycling, storage of carbon, and enhanced water use efficiency as we just recently described. And so from my perspective, carbon coming through the conservation agriculture system results in all of these ecosystem services that are important to all of us in terms of maintaining our food security. But conservation agriculture is also cost effective because it is profitable for the farmers through decreased input costs. This is some anecdotal data that farmers have provided where there are savings of greater than 50% for fuel, labor savings greater than 50%, equipment savings of 40 to 50%, repair and maintenance greater than 40%, savings in nitrogen fertilizer greater than 50%, Similarly with pesticides and greater sa uh, savings in water management as much as greater than 30%. All of these contribute to income in the farmer's pocket because he does not have to expend those costs to be able to utilize this equipment and the, uh, the chemicals and the pesticides, so forth. But this is only half of the story. When we take a look at the other half of the story, conservation agriculture is cost of effective from an environmental quality standpoint for all of us because conservation agriculture avoids the cost of erosion, runoff, pollution, and algae. CA avoids the cost of environmental damage from greenhouse gas emissions and some social issues. Avoids the cost of rehabilitation of degraded soils and the cost of regenerating ecosystem services. And it will also help avoid costs of extreme climate mitigation. Unfortunately, all these are unknown costs and difficult to uh, quantify from an economic standpoint because we don't normally monetize environmental degradation and benefits associated with these improved conservation agriculture systems. But if we're able to assign an economic value to them in some way, then the combination of these two groups of factors makes conservation agriculture pretty important to us in maintaining uh, food, food security while maintaining environmental quality that's important to all of society. And so in the U.S., we have to spend less taxes for repairing the agricultural damage done by intensive tillage. So we can take a look at our soils and contain these living biological partners, enabling carbon and nutrient cycling synergies critical to agricultural ecosystem services. Soil degradation is caused by one word, tillage. Soil recovery and generate regeneration is accomplished by one word, carbon. Soil health maintenance is accomplished by one word, carbon. And so when we put this all together, we get an impression that conservation agriculture systems is pretty important to us in maintaining our food security and environmental quality. And so with that, I end with my cartoon character, Carby Carbon, who asks you to keep your carbon footprint small and manage carbon for ecosystem services. A no-till farmer from Kansas in the US indicating that carbon was king. So Carby Carbon needs a crown and I put a crown on Carby so that he is the king of carbon in our agricultural production systems. It's important that he is there 
and as a reminder of what we can do to maintain resilient production systems. And with that, I will end and look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Don, for your brilliant presentation and for telling us that conservation agriculture is uh, nature's way. Uh, I really enjoyed this, um, this um, um, sentence of your presentation. And thank you for telling um, and uh, reaffirming that conservation agriculture enhances and profits from the importance of carbon for the planet life and contributes uh, for the living ecosystems, which provide economical, environmental and social benefits for humanity. Uh, we will now um, go to the next presentation. I am very happy to introduce you Soren Ilse. Uh, he's a well-known known conservation agriculture practitioner in Denmark and was Green Farm Farmer of the Year in 2013. Soren is involved in a new project with the University of Copenhagen, where they will compare plow, uh, minimum tillage and no-till on his farm and two neighbors. They will measure and they are measuring all part parameters from economic and soil, biological, etc. So, Soren, the stage is yours. Welcome to this session with the title Economy and Biodiversity in Conservation Agriculture Compared to Conventional Farming. My name is Søren Ilse from Denmark. A short presentation of myself. I'm a farmer. I have a farm in East Denmark, uh, and it has been 21 years since the plow has been used here. Uh, implementation of conservation agriculture started in 2011. I'm a member of the ACAF board, and I'm also vice chairman of the Danish association, FRDK. And uh, I'm working for Agrovi, this is an advisory company owned by farmers. To look at the location, uh, we have uh, a map of Europe here with Denmark up in the north. And uh, the eastern part of Denmark is the location here on Sealand, about 70 kilometers southwest of Copenhagen. The GMSR research project is what I'm going to tell you about. We have uh, several fields in the neighborhood located to the project and the project was led by University of Copenhagen. Foundation uh, was from the Velux Foundations and the 15th of June Foundation and Agrovi was a part of the project. The aim was to see if we could reduce resource uh, implements in arable farming and uh, also create a larger biodiversity by changing the arable systems to conservation agriculture. The project was created as a case study of three farms located in very short distance and uh, all uh, field activities was uh, monitored. That was time consumption, machinery operations, diesel consumption, and seed fertilizer and plant protection, and also yield in the different crops and fields. In uh, this, this short time, we only have uh, time to look at some of them. Here are the economic results of winter wheat. As you can see, 2018, we had very poor results. It was the worst drought here in centuries, and it really reduced the yields. Uh, furthermore, was the plowing farm hit by wet weather in the autumn 2017, so they could not establish any winter wheat at all. Uh, a more normal year was 2019, and you can see the economic results in the plowing system and conservation agriculture was almost identical. 
but the minimum silage was uh, uh, very much better. But that was mainly caused by some uh, variety differences, uh, a more healthy variety on the minimum silage farm created better yield. In 2020, we have more equal conditions and uh, also better weather. And you can see that uh, the conservation agriculture results is uh, about 5% less than the plowing system. Uh, time consumption was measured and I won't go into details, but of course, when we uh, remove tillage, it uh, gives a lot of less time consumption, approximately close to one hour per hectare. When we look at the economic results in spring barley, we were rather surprised that uh, it went very well. Uh, spring barley are the most uh, discussed crop in the no-till and conservation agriculture system because we are in a very wet and cold area and it can delay the germination of the crop. But anyway, if we focus on uh, 2020, we can see that in this much more normal year, we had better results in conservation agriculture than in both minimum tillage and plowing uh, systems. One other thing that surprised us very much was that we had success with disc drilling without any tillage of winter oilseed rape. We had a yield in 2019 uh, close to five tons per hectare and it was more than 10% uh, better yield than in the plowing system. So uh, it was very inspiring that uh, we had this great success uh, in uh, no-till of winter oil seed rape. If we make a summary, we can say that uh, net economic results was at the same or higher level than conventional plowing. Diesel consumption was reduced 40% in total for all machinery operations for the whole growing season. And conservation agriculture has phased out insecticides. So that means that especially uh, no insecticides are used for aphids in the grain crops. And the labor and machinery cost was lower than the cloud system as expected. The University of Copenhagen also investigated the uh, insects in the free systems. Uh, traps was placed in fields so that could be measured how many insects uh, there was of beetles and spiders. Here we see the uh, amount of spiders. Uh, to the left we have conservation agriculture and to the right the plowing systems in different distances from the field borders. And it's very clear that the population of spiders are approximately 10 times higher in CA fields than conventional plowed fields. The uh, population of ground beetles was not, not higher in uh, population, but uh, larger species and more stable populations in the fields. In the conventional, it was influenced by the border of the fields and uh, the numbers in, uh, decreased in the fields, but it was also smaller species of ground beetles. One other thing that was measured was the population of earthworms. And as you can see here, the biomass counting was much higher, about 10 times higher in conservation agriculture than in the plowed system. And that was mainly because the dominance of the large earthworm Lumbricus terrestris, which was very few uh, in the plowed systems. We also have seen positive effects on populations, especially of lapwings and partridges. The uh, uh, surface of the soil gives them much more camouflage to hide, especially uh, the chickens. And also uh, there are better conditions for finding food on the surface of the soil. Another research 
from uh, Denmark showed that skylarks is also higher in conservation agriculture and mini motility systems than the plowed. The investigations looked at eight different fields for with the plowed systems. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Soren, uh, for your very interesting presentation. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that in our discussion, we will be able to ask you some more questions uh, about your uh, study. Uh, so I'll carry on to the next uh, presentation, which will be held by Christian Thurfelder. Uh, who is a senior cropping system agronomist. Since 2009, Christian has led CIMIT's conservation agriculture systems research in Southern Africa with the aim to adapt conservation agriculture systems to the needs and environments of smallholder farmers. His research mainly covers Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and to some extent, Namibia. The stage is yours, Christian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to share with you our presentation, Short-Term Gains versus Long-Term Sustainability, the Need for Long-Term Trials in Conservation Agriculture. I would like to mention my co-author, Blessing Malanga, who supported me in putting this presentation together. The challenges in Southern Africa are widespread. They range from soil degradation, to limited use of nutrients in form of fertilizers and periodic climate change events like drought and heat stress, all contributing to declining yields and profitability with a projected reduction in maize yield of 10 to 30% by 2030, and even more if no adaptation measures are taken. The current strategies that we are employing in uh, Southern Africa range around conservation agriculture to increase climate resilience, to reduce soil and land degradation using agronomic solutions, to increase dietary diversity through crop rotation and intercropping, and to foster cropping systems that increase incomes. However, productivity is not a short-term measure. Often we need long-term trends and long-term trials to show how productivity develops. In this, see a long-term trial results that you see in the panel. This is from Chitete Research Station in Malawi. You see that in the first years, there is not uh, much difference between cropping systems. But after the third to fourth cropping season, you see uh, that these um, cropping systems are separating, whereas CA systems like basin or direct seeding systems increase productivity, the conventional system decreases. If we look at the long-term resilience against climate change, here in this case against heat or drought stress, and uh, this result comes from a long-term on-farm data set, over 14 seasons in Malawi, we see that CA systems are more climate resilient and can withstand heat and drought stress. In the top left panel, you see the conventional system with non-stress toler tolerant maize and no rotation, which is much more affected by drought and heat stress. Whereas on the bottom right, you see a CA system with stress tolerant maize and a rotation system which is less affected by drought and also has some form of resilience against heat stress. Finally, nutritional benefits are also measured and there it is important to have a long-term view as well, as well. If we just look at a rotation, which in our case in Southern Africa is an annual rotation, one year you have a cereal, in another year you have a legume, you don't see the benefit of um, the legume in the nutritional value. But if you convert this combination into protein, you see that 
a dibble stick planted direct seeding system with an intercrop has much higher protein values than a rich in furrow system. CA also has social benefits, and uh, those are pretty obvious when you look at this graph. You can save 25 to 35 labor days on planting and another 15 labor days on weeding. So this poor woman on the right side doesn't have to do those ridges anymore when you plant them under uh, direct seeding or no tillage. So in all in all, you see, if we look at the five domains of sustainable intensification, productivity, profitability, environment, social and human benefits, that CA systems outperform conventional rich systems. And uh, we have that convincingly documented in uh, recent research that we have conducted. But the big challenge uh, remains for all of Southern Africa, despite the great benefit and value of conservation agriculture, how do we get it to the masses? CIMIT has looked at different entry points to increase the adoption of conservation agriculture systems. Agronomic solutions that better integrate legumes into cereal systems. Mechanization solutions that support um, seeding, but also support transport and shelling services to make a cadre of service providers providing services to farmers in rural farming communities. And alongside, we can promote conservation agriculture. Finally, CIMIT has worked a lot on farmer acceptance. If we understand farmer decision-making, we can also understand why farms adopt or not adopt conservation agriculture and what needs to be done. So this research is important because for farmers to adopt a knowledge intensive system like conservation agriculture, we really have to understand their decision making. Here are a few agronomic solutions. Strip cropping uh, on the left side, double row strip cropping with uh, legumes in between. The system is uh, able to also accommodate a two wheel tractor that can provide seeding services in the middle of those two cereal, leg uh, cereal rows. On the right side, you have four row strip cropping, even better with uh, direct seeders. Another agronomic solution that we have worked on a lot to increase uh, the legume productivity in the system, we have the so-called doubled up legume system, where you plant a long season legume with a short season legume, in this case, pitch and pea and ground nuts together. By doing so, you increase the land equivalent ratio of the, the system and sustainably intensify. Also, the pitch and pea in this system provides other benefits like firewood and um, shade that helps um, increase what you, what you harvest from your piece of land. Also, the different maturity dates of both groundnuts and uh, pitch and pea help making this system more successful. Another agronomic solution that we have worked on is the integration of trees, in this case, Gliricidia, in the maize legume system. So you can make use of the leaves of the, the, the Gliricidia, which eventually increases the soil carbon content. In Malawi, we also uh, avoided making ridges and plant groundnuts on ridges, but plant them on the flat under CA. By doing so, we can increase the yield of the groundnuts under CA by one ton. These are important entry points for farmers because that will give immediate financial return. Appropriate scale mechanization has happened um, in the last 20 years while I'm here in Southern Africa. We started with manual systems, uh, promoting direct seeding with a stick or with a jab planter. Increasingly, we also promoted animal traction systems with rip lines or direct seeding uh, solutions. But now what is on the agenda is the two-wheel tractor as the main traction force for mechanization of smallholder farmers in Southern Africa. 
Just to give a, a brief um, history there, recently the Permanent Secretary of Zimbabwe uh, has uh, decided to scale a smallholder mechanization through two-wheel tractors on a national scale, targeting about a million farmers in Zimbabwe alone. So I think this will be a very convincing case and help um, expanding conservation agriculture systems. Finally, we have the farmers, and I talked about uh, the importance of farmer decision-making and changing the way we do things. These ladies have been our chief extension officers in getting the systems out. Their farmer networks, they can talk to others and are convincing to them. So in conclusion, long-term trials are needed to show the potential of conservation agriculture in variable climates and agroecologies. CA systems provide benefits in all domains of sustainable intensification. Short-term benefits are needed as viable entry points to make adoption more attractive, and new avenues of research in Southern Africa focus on biophysical and socioeconomic aspects to increase adoption. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, very interesting, your presentation, and uh, congratulations for the work you've been doing in uh, those countries. I'm a fan myself of CIMIT because my country and my farm uh, benefited enormously, enormously from uh, your work and uh, all many countries in the world. Uh, so uh, I will now um, give the stage to Juliana Albertengo. Juliana Albertengo has an MSc in Agronomy from uh, Iowa State University. Uh, Juliana is from Argentina. Uh, she is a conservation agriculture farmer and consultant. Has, uh, she has worked in several countries, including Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Italy, and others. She's, as she has also a deep knowledge on a certification schemes and soil indicators. Please go on, um, Juliana. Hello, my name is Juliana Albertengo. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Uh, my presentation is titled Agricultural Sector Burning, Hidden Impacts on Soil, Crop Yields, Human Health, Water and Climate. It is based on a project I coordinated in Peru some years ago. So, have you ever thought there was a, a link between glaciers and conservation agriculture? Honestly, I, I haven't. But the fact is that when people burn or when farmers burn residue, those black carbon particles travel through the air, reach uh, the glaciers, and glaciers get darker. When they get darker, they melt easier uh, in easily, and they can uh, well they can disappear. So that's why with conservation agriculture, we can also save uh, glaciers. Which are the basics of open burning? Open burning is one of the most significant sources of black carbon. In fact, it is the largest source of black carbon globally. Burning represents a primary cause of particle pollution in many countries, uh, which leads to additional death due to uh, health issues or due to accidents, mainly road accidents. Burning decreases soil fertility and crop yields, leading to a greater uh, need for fertilizer use or deforestation because of land increase. Greater fertilizer use on these brittle soils can lead to an increased runoff and also water pollution, especially when close to cryospheric uh, areas like the Andes or the Himalayas. Uh, it can cause a significant uh, impact on the regional warming or glacier melt. But why do people burn? Which are the, the main reasons that I heard uh, during the, this project? Well, it is said that almost all the open burnings have a natural cost and can be mitigated or managed. Uh, this is false because most of forest fires are a consequence of open burning or another anthropogenic burning. In addition, mitigation is not always negative. 
uh, and with minor investments, uh, it can be achieved. Another thing that I've heard is that burning has beneficial effects on crops and enriches soils. Well, this is obviously false because nutrients are literally burned when they are uh, when when they are um, uh, when one burning occurs. Uh, repeated burning destroys soil structure, water retention capacity, and organic matter, uh, and thus leads us to to a yield decrease. And the third uh, thing that I mostly heard is that there's no other way to do agriculture but with burning and, and tilling. This is, is obviously false too, because there's plenty of examples that show us that, that there are alternatives to, to burning and also to tilling. I believe, or I strongly believe, obviously, that conservation agriculture is the best example or the best alternative. This project was funded by the, by the CCAC Agriculture Initiative, uh, which approach was to, to map uh, fires regionally and nationally over the past 10 years. Uh, and this approach also was focused on outreach to farmers uh, with regional experts and governments also involved. Uh, in, in this, well, the, this initiative and, and this project uh, included demonstration projects and demonstration plots on the field so people could really see and touch uh, what the alternatives were like. Uh, continue mapping and outreach through, throughout the, the project. And it also involved a, in an international expert uh, group, which was called the Strategic Support Group. These were all the, the, the main um, lines or guidelines that led our, our project. It was located in Peru. It has been, um, it has been uh, held uh, from 2017 to 2000, uh, to, sorry, from 2017 yeah, to 2019 in, Guayao, in the Guayao community near Huancayo in Junín area. Uh, in the center of Peru. Uh, it's a cryospheric uh, region uh, and the glacier nearby it's called White Payana. These are the maps that show fires or fire detection, active fires uh, between January and June uh, 2016 and July and December 2016 on the left and on the right. Uh, correspondingly. I'm not an expert uh, on satellites. Uh, our expert is called uh, Jessica Macari. She is from Miami University and she is the one who did uh, those uh, th these maps. So uh, on the graph you can also see that there are black carbon emissions throughout all the year or not throughout all the years. All the year, uh, there are two satellites, MODIS and BIRS. It, they have different um, details or, or, or different functions, but they both can show us uh, when black carbon uh, is emitted. And that's why we, we've chosen Peru uh, in the Andean region. Uh, this uh, project main alternative to burning was obviously conservation agriculture. Uh, there was a, also a twin project uh, in Punjab, India, in the Himalayan area. Uh, they also address conservation agriculture there. Uh, and the one who coordinated that project was Alex Gittelson. Conservation agriculture was a basic uh, or the basis uh, of this uh, of this project, as I mentioned. This is uh, the picture of a communal plot uh, on the right side. Uh, we did the traditional agriculture with till and burn, and on the left side, we decided to do conservation agriculture. So everyone in the community could see every day the differences between one uh, treatment and and the other. We did uh, a lot of trainings because farmers' education was also a, a key of this project. We did some farmers' group. Uh, we invest in machinery. In fact, we we purchased um, hand seeder hand seeders uh, twenty hand seeders.
uh, two animal driven tractors and uh, cedar and one tractor driven cedar uh, that are now in the community for everyone to use it. Incentives also are, are key. Uh, we dealt with governments to, to reach those incentives. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't get an economic incentive, but uh, the trainings and well, the, the savings that they have uh, during this project were a, a key uh, incentive for them. So some results. Uh, the number of uh, cops was statistically higher and their conservation agriculture 42 percent uh, higher the yield was also statistically higher 82 percent more uh, there were less uh, human hours per hectare because there's a lot of manual work here there was less soil erosion under conservation agriculture a uh, hundred and six percent these are all numbers from the communal plot that i've showed in uh, in the previous slide there were much uh, economic savings under conservation agriculture more free time for for the farmer and as they had less hard job they had a health improvement due to less respiratory uh, problems and uh, muscular problems too this is another another uh, field or another plot uh, in the project. Uh, this farmer is called Nazario. That was his first planting using the tools that he had uh, at that time in the community. Uh, on the right, you can see the corn uh, some days after. Uh, we didn't have the, the conservation agriculture cedar at that time. That's, that's why uh, we used that tool to open the row and, and put the seed on it. So what we've learned, that training should never stop. Seeing is believing. Farmers need national examples. Uh, our national example was called Lorenzo Solier. Um, he, he is a farmer from Cañete and we did a lot of uh, field um, a lot of study tours uh, to his farm. Food safety and health are a matter of all. We all need to take care of that. We do not have to demonize the, the farmer uh, because the farmer is doing the best he can with the information that he has at the time. Uh, change can come quickly, uh, even if it, if this was a two-year project, we, we saw real changes in farmers. Uh, and we well we we really saw that they were eager to train to 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 receive training and to have more information some final points reduction of open burning may be the single largest and most cost effective mitigation option for health and climate uh, conservation agriculture brings a lot of opportunities and challenges for, for small farmers. We need to help them find out those challenges that might be, uh, for example, the construction of a national cedar, a national conservation uh, agriculture cedar, or machinery, or any other tool that it is not uh, in, in the country. There are a lot of alternatives to burning. However, I strongly believe that conservation agriculture is the one that best approaches uh, sustainability as a whole, uh, because it includes uh, all the, the levers and all the, um, the topics of uh, sustainability. So thank you for, for your time and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I learned the more and I uh, learned a lot. And um, I uh, notice and find three things you said very important that, um, as Christian said, that uh, conservation agriculture needs less human hours, less hard job. Uh, and farmers do care for environment and the future. Uh, not always we are uh, seen like people who care about uh, the environment and that conservation agriculture brings a lot of, of opportunities for small uh, farmers. Um, I'm very happy now to um, ch change um, for um, Jardel Passinato. Uh, Jardel Passinato is an agronomist. 
uh, has a master's degree uh, in soil science, science and is an academic member of Aquarius Project at the Federal University of Santa Maria in Brazil. He is the son of rural producers, having since childhood the link of work and dedication to agriculture. Uh, go on, um, Jardel, please. Hello, my name is Jardel Nikosnat. I am an agronomist engineer and currently master's student in soil science at the Federal University of Santa Maria. Our study is in Chitled Soil Health Checkup, Brazilian Conservation and Culture Fire Systems, and the co-authors of this paper are Drs. Delma Mado, José Alain Costa, and Amir Tassan. The projected global population growth over the next decades to increase the demand for food, fiber, biofuel, energy, water, and other agricultural products. As a consequence, there will be growing pressure on natural ecosystems, which are already facing sustainability challenges due to climate change, soil degradation, and loss of biodiversity. Therefore, there is an urgent need to redesign agricultural production systems in order to reduce the environmental, economic, and social damage. Currently, Brazil has about 35 million hectares of agricultural areas managed under CA spread in different agroregions, with different levels of implementation of CA to the continental dimensions of the country. And there is a need and an opportunity to capture the changing biological activity and soil health. The typical Brazilian cropping farm systems differ from region to region. In the south, we have two harvests per year on summer and on winter. Usually, usually based on soybean cultivation, follow the soil cover plants in winter, subsequently, car and close the rotation with wheat or barley. In the Cerrado and Northwest, two distinct, distinct periods on wheat season and on dry season, dry season. In these agro regions, there is the possibility of growing two crops of economic importance and also the insertion of cover plants of soil in off season. In this way, the main objective is studied was to assess soil health through enzymes activity of long-term CA croplands in main Brazil agro regions. In onset field, the DNA characterization was investigated in order to capture bio microbiome, biodiversity, and different crop yield environments with within the field. This study was carried out in semi fields for the production of long term grain assets under CA, which are located in my Brazil agro, agro regions of Midwest Cerrado and Northwest, involving four states of the country totaling 63 sampling points. In each of these fields, the existing database was analyzed using harvest maps and satellite, and based on this, three environments of yield potentials are delimited. The high yield environment was classified as 110% of average productivity of the field. The medium yield environment as 80 to the 110%. And the low has less than 80% of average productivity. In each productivity environment, within the field sampling was carried out three replications. In first study, follow the following sampling and analysis strategies of enzyme activity are carried out. The soil was collected around 40 days after the crop emergence at a depth of 10 centimeters, uh, 10 centimeters each subsample consisted of seven collection points, one in the center of the crop row and three on each side of the row. Uh, where each geography point consisted of five super samples collected within a five meters of the center of this point. Subsequently, the samples were sifted in two millimeter mesh 
removing the results and the course particles. After that, the soil samples were are dry, dry and the determination of enzyme activity following Tabata by methodologies. And beta glucose days and the days were analyzed. All of the fields uh, of the first project that had a large uh, viable database was used to DNA characterization. The sign of the area is a radical flux, and this field is managed under CA science 2 on 202. The ground season of 290 and 220. Uh, soil samples were collected in different field environments, and these soil plant samples uh, were sent to biomakers in USA for molecular analysis of microbiota. To characterize both the bacteria and fungal microbial communities associated with the soil, the 60s RNA and ETS marker regions were selected. The varieties are purified adder. Following the two steps, the CR Illumina protocol and DN sequence was conducted in Illumina MC, MDC instrument was prior and sequence. Chemical soil analysis of both studies were performed, and the contents of soil organic matter, pH in water, potassium, and phosphor extracted by Mercury solution, calcium, magnesium, and aluminium extracted with potassium chloride solution. In calcium exchange capacity, pH 7 was determined by the sum of its exchangeable base plus mass potential acidity. The soil texture was determined by pipette method. The results of enzymes activity, chemical analysis, and crop yields were submitted to variance analysis with 1 and 5 percent of error. Then Pearson's correlation, the relationship of the sum and the number of the species and enzymes activity were analyzed by linear and quadratic adjustments. The enzyme activity and sum relative average in each meeting field with environment were compared based on the Turkey test. According to the agro region, the sign attributes show difference in their effect on soil activity. Soil texture had an eff effect in salt and southwest region, but not in northwest. In general, in the salt and central west regions, the increase of sand content was associated with a uh, decrease in enzymes activity. On the other hand, in northwest, where the soils are very sandy and there is an air variation in the soil texture, the, this relationship was not verified. In our study, the clay content had a relationship with bad glucose days in the soup and with a risk of as in soup and central west regions. The SEC had positive effects on enzymes activity in soup and central west regions. These results indicate that nutrient management plays an important role in some recovery and destructive soils. Um, the calcium content had positive relationship with enzymes activity in the central west region. In addition, counter average CA uh, calcium had relationships of 5,9 and 7,2 with beta glucose days and the days enzyme activity. The sun had a stronger, a stronger relationship with enzymes activity. In salt, in the central west regions with values 77 and 83. In northwest region, the sum had a relationship with black glucose days, but not with hydrosphatase. Moreover, in this region, the only soil root that had a relationship with enzyme activity was some. The figure it showed that some had a linear, linear positive relationship with bad glucose days, which explained around 60% of variability of enzymes activity. The maximum enzyme activity was reached rich, with maximum high sum content, less than 5%. The aerospatase had a quadratic relationship with some, with the maximum activity reached at 3 and 
a half percent. In our study, we had around 40% of data points with low sum than two percent uh, that were associated with low enzyme activity. This data suggested an urgent need to review the use of carbon system ancient rotations and cover crops in order to build up soil health in this important parcel of Brazilian CA regions. In the graph we can present here, we can observe it that the better cause the Zairus phase enzyme activity where efficient distinguish with a high and medium yield environments from the low envir uh, yield environment. However, the sum levels are not sensitive enough for this distinction. The beta glucose days and rusfatase had a positive linear relationship with the biodiversity assessed by DNA characterization. The coefficient of determination between beta glucose days and rusfatase with the number of microbial species were 85 and 79, where the more diverse was our soil with this, in terms of species of microorganisms, the greater its enzyme activity. These result, results support the enzyme activity level to be a sensitive indicator of soil health. Conclusions. In, gen in general, the fine part soil particles, SAC, calcium content, and sun, had a positive relationship with beta glucose days and rusfatase ac activity in Brazilian agro regions in that In be the beta glucose days and rusfatase enzymes activity were efficient indicators of biodiversity under conservation agriculture. Also, the enzymes activity was an efficient tool to distinguish the variation between within few the yield environments. 40% of data points invested had low sum content because low enzymes activity and restricts biodiversity. These results enforce the conclusion that the three principles of conservation agriculture operating synergistically in order to build up the soil health in production systems. We would like to thank the Aquarius Project with the partner companies and ABDE for the support to CAPES and CNPK for scholarships and biomakers by DNA analysis. Here are the reference used during the presentation. We leave our content here and thank everyone who watched us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jardel. Uh, very interesting and thorough study of, on the uh, contribution of conservation agriculture for soil biological activity and the relation uh, of uh, soil organic matter with uh, uh, the soil uh, biologic uh, life. Thank you very much. Um, I will switch. Uh, on to uh, Marie Soleil Thermal. Um, Marie Soleil Thermal is uh, from Canada. Uh, she's a researcher, agronomist, on, and a soil scientist with uh, many years of experience uh, working in Latin America. She's currently a regional technical advisor for the Catholic Relief uh, Services Water Smart Agriculture Program in Central America. Uh, please go on, Marie. Hello and greetings from Mexico. My name is Marie Termel and I am a regional technical advisor with Catholic Relief Services in the Latin America and Caribbean region. I'll be speaking today about how farmers in the dry corridor of Central America are managing their soils to manage water for productivity and climate resilience. The Dry Corridor is a region that runs along the Pacific side of Central America, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. It's been defined over the past 10 years as one of the regions in the world most susceptible to increasing climate variability. Much of the production is in hillside rain-fed systems, um, and an estimated 74% of agricultural soils are degraded due to poor management, and water is one of the main limiting factors for production. 
The yield potential in the region is considered to be about 4.5 tons per hectare for maize, but average maize yields are usually below three tons per hectare and as low as one ton per hectare. Um, rainfall in the region is becoming increasingly variable. Uh, while the total annual precipitation is between 800 and 1500 millimeters per year, it's poorly distributed throughout the growing season. And there's a mid uh, growing season dry spell known as the canicula that is frequently prolonged leading to yield damage and even complete crop loss in severe drought years. Um, the most uh, recent severe drought affecting the whole region was uh, in 2018, where 2.2 million people were affected by yield loss and 1.4 million left food insecure. Thus, climate and soil degradation are major drivers of uh, poverty and food insecurity in the region. Our approach with water smart agriculture is to restore the green water potential of soils. So green water is the water that's available in the soil for plant production. In rain fence systems, um, part of the water falls that falls will be lost in runoff and evaporation and only part will infiltrate into the soil and become green water. The degraded soils uh, store less green water, whereas healthy soils uh, infiltrate and retain more green water, which means the crop will be less impacted by periods without rain and overall rainwater productivity of the system is improved. Uh, water smart agricultural practices can restore and improve the potential of our soils uh, to store green water and build up that system's productivity. So WSA practices include minimal soil movement, residue retention permanent with, and with permanent soil cover, um, in diversification uh, with cover crops and agroforestry, uh, and integrated soil fertility fertility management. So essentially, uh, conservation agriculture systems adapted to the Central American context. And combining these key practices ensures uh, both the short-term and long-term gains for farmers um, and improves both the productivity and drought resilience. So the WSA program has established over 3,000 side-by-side innovation plots for evidence building on productivity, income, and water and soil um, indicators. And we're also adapting uh, practices to local conditions in these plots and refining uh, technical recommendations. Um, and they're also the center for farmer field schools and farmer to farmer learning and promoting adoption of practices. So as you know, it takes several years of soil restoration to um, show a measurable change in soil organic carbon. And, in our trials in Nicaragua, we compared uh, WSA systems with a, a conventional system um, with tillage, no crop residue retention uh, or cover crops and poor soil fertility management. And results show that after four years of uh, conversion to WSA, there is on average uh, an increase of 0.19% soil organic carbon per year or approximately 1.10% uh, 1.8 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Uh, these are exciting results that show that major improvements in soil organic carbon and uh, soil organic matter and soil health can occur in relatively short time um, using simple agronomic practices that are accessible to farmers. And these changes in soil health translate into greater soil moisture retention and climate resilience. In 2018, the dry corridor experienced a severe drought and the map um, shows the July precipitation compared to the average precipitation compared to 2018 when the region received less than half of the average rainfall in some areas even went 20 to 45 days without rain. The soil health uh, and uh, crop residue retention WSA plots was key for retaining soil moisture during that drought um, that occurred in the middle of the growing season after initially good rains in June. So under these drought conditions, WSA plots maintained up to 8% more volumetric soil moisture during the key um, early maize reproductive stages and resulted in maize yields that were on average 39% higher than the comparison. And these improvements in soil health and soil water translate into improved rainwater productivity, which is the volume of um, crop produced per amount of rainfall. And essentially the crop per drop and an indicator of how efficiently our agricultural systems use rainwater. So rainwater productivity is increasing or improving over the years with WSA practices. 
Um, it's climbed from 21% in the first year. Um, mainly this was due to improvements in crop nutrition. And as soil health is improved and farmers are fine tuning their WSA management, rainwater productivity continues to increase and it's up to 40% now in 2019 and um, continues to improve. WSA um, also increases food production. So over the past four years, uh, the WSA in the WSA plots, yields of course have gone up and down following patterns in rainfall. However, yields have been consistently higher than the comparison um, as, and as soil is restored, um, and farmers fine tune their management practices uh, with WSA, this yield response um, continues to increase. So in 2019, despite uh, the poor rainfall, WSA reached 3.5 tons per hectare of maize compared to only 2.5 in the comparison. This is a 40% increase. And we're seeing similar improvements in beans. So WSA um, yields were 1.6 tons per hectare in 2019, which is considered an excellent yield for smallholders in the region and was over half a ton higher than the comparison. So to put this in the local context, the average uh, family in Central America needs at least one ton of maize per hectare or per year uh, to meet their minimal food requirements. And this is a major challenge for farmers um, especially those that are uh, farming less than one hectare. And so uh, results from our 2018 drought showed that many farmers uh, that were limited by both uh, water and soil fertility conditions couldn't meet this minimum production level in a drought year using their current practices. But with WSA, um, on average, the yields were about this uh, critical threshold, showing that WSA has the potential to improve food security in the region. And yield improvements are also translating into greater income and the average total income of the maize bean system has doubled with WSA. So the WSA program's goal is to achieve transformation at scale, which requires the commitment and collaboration of key agricultural institutions in each country. And this scaling strategy involves strengthening and directing support services, programs, education and extension to WSA to provide uh, farmers with these key services they need to restore their soils. And some of the key initiatives um, in the region are the reform of educational curriculums to include WSA competencies and in, in, in the initiation of a Central American master's level program in tropical soil and water management. We're also developing digital soil mapping capacity at the national level in each country and working to strengthen extension systems around soil and water management through train, trainers, initiatives, and farmer field schools. And overall, there are over 90 institutions that are incorporating WSA tools and methodologies and strategies into their programs and are now immersed in this scaling process. So the main uh, takeaways uh, to wrap things up are that basic agronomic practices um, that improve soil and water and crop nutrition can lead to substantial gains for smallholders in the short term. Uh, with WSA, farmers are producing more, earning more, and are more resilient to drought. There's potential to mitigate uh, the impacts of climate change through carbon sequestration and improve food security in the region. Um, but the work is not done. The scaling and institutional, institutionalization of WSA requires more time, continued support, and greater investment. So thank you very much, and uh, special thanks to the Howard G. Buffett Foundation for their financial support. And feel free to contact me. My email, um, my email address is here on the slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marie, uh, for very, your very interesting presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the sentence, more crop per drop. Um, water scarcity is uh, something that many farmers in many places of the world are facing, uh, namely uh, in the southern of Europe and uh, in my country. Uh, so the use, the efficient use of water is very important. Uh, we uh, farmers uh, who practice conservation agriculture, we know how conservation agriculture can help us to uh, make uh, the use of water uh, more efficient. 
and as the other uh, the other uh, uh, speakers you um, said that it's very important education farmers education is very important and uh, financial support is very important to uh, bring acceptance from the farmers to uh, more um, practices of conservation agriculture and sustainable agriculture. We are now uh, moving into the next uh, speaker. Uh, I think uh, the uh, presentation is um, is on. So um, let me pre uh, present you, introduce you, Ivo Melo. Ivo Melo um, is an agronomist from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. He is currently a superior uh, agriculture technician of IRDA. Ivo has experience in the area in the area of agronomy, with emphasis on rice farming and management of water resources. He is a specialist on irrigation, no-till farming, sustainable management, quality management, basin committees, and water use allocation. Uh, welcome, Ivo. You have the stage. Okay. We will talk about our experience in um, Itaipu in, in hydroelectricity power plant and uh, self-assessment index to improve no-till quality towards conservation agriculture. Some lessons learned and conclusions. And um, then the contest, you, the, the contest of the Itaipu uh, watershed in the, the reservoir, we have in the with tillage uh, era. Uh, we had some uh, problem with uh, erosion, you, you all know. And in the very, very uh, close to the Itaipu region, our Herbert Parks in memoriam now, in 1972, uh, began with the uh, no-till in Brazil. And then this uh, image from Frank Dijkstra, another pioneer, shows the difference between the, the systems to no-till. And uh, it's interesting to, to remark that uh, in Rio 92, the Brazilian Federation of No-Till Farmers Association presented um, in the, this uh, meeting, the global meeting about uh, environment issues, the no-till. And uh, in the, the two years later, uh, we presented to the Itaipu Binacional what uh, the uh, no-till can do for the and um, to, until 2003, the no-till ad adoption expand the dam lifespan in mitigation soil erosion losses. Uh, and uh, exactly in 2003, supported by Itaipu, our uh, federation and CAPA, the, the American Association of No-Till Farmers Association, we um, run the, the Second World Congress on Conservation Agriculture, and um, we, in this time, uh, Itaipu Binational um, began with an, a new approach, the sustainable energy generation with Cochivando Agmobu, or Cropping Good Water Program. And one of the, la the goals on, uh, uh, was uh, for land management proof, no chill quality. And this is because we, in the Brazilian laws, we have to, to have the territory for planning sustainable uh, approach is uh, the watershed and the uh, Itaipu uh, begin with the Paraná Pre watershed that is the the, the, the watershed that uh, contributes for the reservoir in the Brazilian side of the, the reservoir. And uh, you can see in this uh, map that uh, the land use. Uh, Evo, excuse me, oh, Evo, Evo, excuse me. Okay. Uh, your Sorry. slides are not uh, moving. Not moving? Not moving. We're ah. still on the first slide. Because in uh, oh sorry. Huh. Yeah. Okay. No. Sorry. 
I am. I can. Not working. Ivo. Oh, oh, hello. Diga, diga qual página, diga a regi qual página para qualquer ir. Say the number of the page you want to be on. 11. 11? Ah, ok. This is the, the Second World Congress. It's on the, the, the screen now, ok. This is the 7. But I, I am in the 11. OK, but go ahead. OK. OK. OK, it's in the, in the 11. OK, and go ahead. The next one, please. But how to improve uh, no-chill quality? Uh, next, please. We have to have a behavior change. We have to be motivate people, farmers and society. Next, please. And then, the, and then we, we propose the no-chill system quality index with a participatory approach. Next, please. This is the, the beginning of the, the project. Uh, that um, we built with the Municipality Watershed Committee, that is a, a, an initiative from the Itaipu. Next, please. And uh, was based on technology and knowledge established by science. And uh, the backbone of the change strategy is the community mobilization and participation as the backbone. Please, the next, please. And uh, this is the framework of uh, the indicator that we choose in this uh, watershed. And uh, next, please. Next, please. And uh, this uh, approach generate easy to understand values of quality parameters from zero to 10. Next. Deliver on assessments of strengths and suggest actions to improve CA at farmers level. Next, please. And generates a PDCA cycle for farmers. This is plan, do, next, please. Plan, do, check, and action for the, to in, improve, to continuous improvement of quality in the management quality. Next, please. And uh, the overall results have been an increase in the life expectancy of the Taipu Dam complex to 350 years with co-benefits in the watershed related with the increased farm productivity and income. Next, please. This, those uh, both graphs uh, show that uh, the yield uh, improved in maize and soybean in the uh, Paraná tree watershed, that's uh, one of the results of the COVID benefits that we have in a uh, no chill improvement. It's, uh, it's uh, no chill to, towards conservation agriculture. Next, please. And uh, lessons learned, next, please. The success of conservation agriculture in Panana tree watershed has been achieved by increasing crop and farm productivity in the, the graphs you showed that, and incomes while also provide improving sustainability of the soil resource base. Next, please. The methodology produces farmers who are more knowledgeable and confident about the, their conservation agriculture practices. Next, please. And society benefits from the positive externalities of 
conservation agriculture system through reductions in sedimentation and eutrophication of Itaipu Reservoir. Next, please. It's a win-win approach. We are very, very uh, sure about that. Next, please. And as conclusions, Mac, tillage agriculture, agriculture is not suitable for sustainable land management. We, we all know this. Next, please. Sustainable intensification of agriculture and ecosystem protection can coexist harmoniously. Next, please. Community based soil and water conservation programs can be developed in a socially equitable manner. Next, please. And the achievements of the project have been dependent, dependent upon the goodwill, investments, and cooperation of several stakeholders. Stakeholders. This is key issue now because this, we have this. We have to have the systemic approach, integrating sectoral policies, and this is a big, big challenge. Next, please. And we have a. a, a Another big challenge that uh, the soybean is the queen, and the the, the, the farmers they 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 are very um, they they want to 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 make money, and the, the soybean nowadays for us in Brazil is the the, the queen. Uh, it's the, it's easy to make money with soybeans, and then we have to improve crop rotation with uh, some uh, cereals, and then this is a a, a a big challenge for us. Next, please. Thank you, and we are available for, for questions. Sorry for the this. OK, Ivo, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, again, another pros, uh, presentation on uh, water use uh, efficiency and the importance of water to increase productivity and income in uh, farmers. Uh, in Brazil, as well as in the other uh, areas of uh, of the planet, uh, and uh, I I'm, uh, can enhance one of your conclusions, which is sustainable intensification and ecosystem protection can coexist harmon harmoniously, which I agree totally with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. We are now going to the um, Q&A questions and answers uh, discussion. Uh, we have some questions here from uh, some attendees, attendants. Let me see if I can see them because uh, sometimes they disappear. Um, there is a question sorry about that but it's now mine that is not working mm, i can I was help. Seeing, ah here here i am so we have a, a first question from shangshuan jiang uh, of uh, f from fao and the question is for jardel Passinato from Brazil, uh, he has two questions. The first one is, when analyzing the microbiome, in addition to the soil associated microbiome, do you also analyze the plant associated microbiomes? And the second one is, what are the main challenges in employing microbiome sciences in the soil health analysis in conservation agriculture. Please, Jardel, can you uh, answer the question? Thank you for the question. Uh, sorry, I am not fluent in English. Uh, I believe that my teacher, Thelmo, can help me to answer them. Uh, we uh, were analyzing the microbiome uh, for, uh, with the biomakers. And I had a list of the, the various microorganisms are including in, uh, in our soil uh, sample. And in is our 
Can you help me, teacher? Sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, Gabriela, thanks for the, the question. Uh, we sampling uh, at the flowering stage, fl flowering crop stage, and uh, we didn't uh, do at this stage of uh, research the plant biome, only the soil biome. And uh, because Brazil has a continental uh, scale country, it's a big country, so it was very uh, challenging for us get the the sampling uh, in the same season, but uh, we are able to do that. And uh, so that was the the, the answer to that uh, the question. And the second one is what are the main challenges in employing microbiome sciences in the soil health analysis in conservation agriculture? Uh, Thanks, Gabriela, to remind me. Yes, uh, that is the, the big challenge by now. We, we have a, a good picture, I could say, of uh, chemical analysis. We made a good progress in some physical analysis, especially regarding soil compaction. And now the challenge is the bioanalysis. Embrapa is doing a very good uh, work to push that in Brazil. Uh, we already have a net uh, of uh, soil labs that are being able to, to give this information to our farmers. Uh, the price of analysis is uh, comparable to chemical analysis. And uh, so we are pushing that and that uh, as a universe, uh, we are trying to associate um, the results with some soil attributes. In our case, soil organic matter, uh, calcium and clay content was were the main drivers. Thank you, Telmo. Muito obrigada. Um, there's a um, uh, Shang Xuan Jiang, the, the same person who asked uh, you these two questions, congratulates you for your work. And he says, I was so glad to see the speaker combines the conservation agriculture with the cutting edge microgram, microbram, uh, microbiome sciences. Well, I was very uh, impressed uh, too. Uh, I was impressed by all the uh, the presentations. The uh, next question is from Florence Reed, and she asks, um, let's see, she doesn't uh, spec specify for whom, and I'll see who, who will have to, to answer. What is the best way for an NGO that has provided conservation agriculture training to 3,000 farmers in Central America over the past 24 years to collaborate with others to replicate our proven methodology at a larger scale. So I suppose the, the question can be answered by Christian and uh, by um, uh, Julian Albertengo. I don't know if I'm right. Okay. So yeah, I, don't, I think the question was more to Marie Soleil, but um, um, <laughs> oh, Marie, yeah, um, yeah, Marie too. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, scaling of conservation agriculture is a major challenge, um, and it requires um, not only the technology per se but uh, partnerships uh, with networks and um, NGO partners are important in the scaling. Um, Marie, do you have more to add there? Uh, thanks, Christian, for starting us off with that answer. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, you know, our goal, with, uh, CRS's goal is to scale CA in Central America, and we realize we, we're not doing that alone. Uh, NGOs don't work in isolation. We're working through uh, local permanent actors um, in each country and in very 
uh, close collaboration with local governments at the national and, uh, and municipal scales. Um, these are the permanent actors that are really going to scale um, these practices. And um, so my recommendation to this organization, I'm sure, I mean, it sounds like you've already done a lot of work training 3,000 farmers. So really uh, connecting to these networks, there's a lot of momentum right now in Central America around soil restoration, land restoration. Um, so really connecting to the local networks and looking for synergies with, with other organizations, uh, government and even private sector to, to scale out. And I would encourage you also to, yeah, to reach out to, to me or, or CRS and, uh, and we can help connect you also. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, uh, Marie. Thank you, Christian. Uh, well, I understand very well the problem of, uh, raising acceptance of these kind of uh, techniques. We uh, have the same problem uh, in the southern parts of uh, Europe and uh, mainly in my, in my country, but we are uh, now seeing a more um, a higher acceptance from the farmers, at least uh, uh, they're more aware that they have to protect soil and uh, other resources. Um, there's a question of uh, Geoffrey Wangela, and he's asking, I think this question is probably to Christian, what is the average yield of soybean per uh, acre in kilos in Malawi in conservation agriculture? And what is the crop spacing on plant seed rate per acre? Thank you very much. Is that a question for Christian? I would say so. Because it's too low. Sorry about that. Um, we operate on a hectare basis, not on an acre basis. So I'm not um, mathematician enough to quickly convert that. But um, what we are um, currently getting on farmers fields is something like 2.5 tons per hectare. Um, in uh, CA systems, um, but uh, we can uh, reach uh, almost five tons per hectare in Malawi or Zimbabwe. Um, it really depends on the plant spacing that you employ. We currently uh, grow soybeans uh, under a very narrow row spacing uh, with 440,000 plants per hectare. So that uh, is uh, possible uh, to reach five tons per hectare. But um, it also depends if farmers use inoculum or not, uh, if they plant on the right time. Um, and uh, if they don't do all these things, it can be less than a ton per hectare. So uh, with all what we do, uh, it has to be at the right time with the highest standards that we can employ. Um, and then you, you reach uh, uh, good uh, yields on soybeans. Now you are the one who is mute. <laughs> I always forget. Um, thank you very much, Christian. There's another question, which I suppose is for you again. Uh, it's from Sara uh, Berzuini, and she's asking, what, which kind of legume crops do you use? Have you ever considered using sun hemp Crotolaria yes. juncea? Uh, yes. If uh, Juliana or Marie have um, an answer for this one, I will be very glad to to give them the word too. Be before they come in, sorry, uh, ladies. Um, we we use all grain legumes uh, that can be grown in Southern Africa, be it beans, um, uh, soybeans, cowpea, pigeon pea, um, and others but we also focus a lot of our work on uh, green manures and uh, Crotularia juncea is one of them. Uh, it grows extremely well in Southern Africa. The problem with Crotularia is that it has very limited use beyond soil fertility improvement, and that makes uh, farmers not adopting it at large because it cannot be uh, easily fed to animals, especially if it's a bit older and then they don't like to eat it so much. Uh, other green manures are more favorite. But now, ladies, uh, sorry that I took the, the first shot. 
No, no problem, Christian. Well, in, in Peru, we also use a, a lot of legumes uh, in the area where the project was held or where in the project that I participated. Uh, it's a very, um, a very high um, location. It's more than 3,000 meters above the sea, ground, uh, the sea level. So we use uh, green peas and avas as the main legumes in, in the crop rotations for the farmers. Marie? Yeah, so in Central America, um, the main cover crops that we're using are um, Mucuna and um, uh, Jack Bean, known locally as Canavalia. So this one uh, is more adapted to the drier conditions um, that we have there, whereas Mucuna is more for the wetter uh, regions. And, um, and then we're also incorporating um, actual edible beans, uh, even some local, uh, very local varieties um, into the rotations uh, that have multiple purpose and also looking at incorporating more um, legume forages into the systems like around the crop borders, uh, uh, trying to address uh, trade-offs with uh, crop residues and animals. Thank you very much to all. There's another question who is from uh, uh, one speaker. Uh, so after that question, if any other speaker would like to ask a, a question, I will be happy to, um, to accept it. So Ivo Mello uh, congratulates uh, Don for his presentation and asks uh, if uh, talking about ecosystem services, how much society must pay for the carbon in soils that in, uh, that improves water use efficiency? So how how much society must pay for the carbon in soils that improves water use efficiency? Is Don with us? Probably he's not hearing us. Uh, is is any other of the speakers who has um, an answer to this question? On we, we don't have an exact number <laughs> if it's $10 or $50 or $100. But um, I think uh, in future we would have to price uh, this better. Currently, we're expecting from smallholder or larger uh, holder farmers um, to do a society uh, benefit basically for free. Uh, we, we expect them to um, do no tillage, to retain residues, to rotate, uh, and that also, it has all societal benefits um, to the environment. Uh, it reduces erosion and all the others that Don has, has um, presented. But uh, it's still for free. Uh, the society benefits, but it doesn't pay. And um, while on the other hand, uh, subsidies are being paid for farmers uh, to increase the productivity. Um, and, um, you know, um, with unforeseen um, effects on the environment, degradation and all of that, um, so even, I mean, just an example in Botswana, farmers get a subsidy to get their fields plowed by the government, which is a ridiculous uh, situation because in Botswana, there is hardly any carbon in the soil left. Uh, so I, I, I strongly uh, believe and argue for um, uh, environmental benefit payment for farmers who practice conservation agriculture. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I wonder whether, Soren, uh, do you have any calculation on this kind of uh, payment that uh, farmers can receive for, uh, in your country, uh, that farmers can receive for uh, carbon uh, storage? Because myself, I've heard, uh, as Christian said, many many figures. The, the, um, the last one was $50 per ton of uh, carbon sequestered. Uh, and we in Europe are measuring that uh, in terms 
in order to have um, uh, agri-environmental measures on the uh, new common agriculture policy. Have you measured any of those ecosystem services that conservation agriculture is providing uh, in your country, for example? Have you calculated a value for that? Uh, I can say that it is uh, starting to get more in, uh, information about what conservation agriculture can do here in this country. Uh, but uh, direct support is uh, not uh, available in any way. And I don't think it is the future because subsidies is a problem. Uh, what we would like here is, a, for instance, three year converse, conversation uh, support. So farmers who are risky about their yield losses and uh, uh, the, the risk about changing what they know can be supported for three or four years or something and then uh, degraded uh, and uh, ending at uh, zero. That could move a lot of farmers. Uh, but right now we have some financial uh, institutes that uh, can support with, um, with uh, no interest rate loans for no-till cedars and so on. So that, that is also helping. But the new thing here is that we have a company called uh, Commodity Trader that has been trading with uh, grain and fertilizer between farmers and so on. They had added a new uh, segment called Commodity Carbon. And uh, that means that uh, farmers changing to minimum tillage or even better, of course, conservation agriculture now can be um, certificated to uh, 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 be approved uh, in the growing system. That means that they will be monitored for a year. They have to deliver all their growing information, typically from a, a management system. And uh, there will be uh, uh, checks on, on, uh, from satellites and so on if they are doing tillage and so on. But that means that they will receive some CO2 certificates and one ton of CO2 is uh, one certificate. And uh, typically, it is a change from tillage to uh, adding carbon that uh, gives the certificate. Because here in our country, uh, a lot of uh, investigations shows that the good soils loses one ton of carbon per hectare per year in the plowing systems. That is 3.6 tons of CO2. And first we have to make that a zero. <laughs> and then we can start building up uh, carbon in the soil. So, so the difference uh, in that will be calculated. And that is uh, a cool farm tools uh, that has been used in a modi modified form for, for our climate. And uh, typically we can have a three to, in best case, four certificates per hectare and one ton of carbon is right now uh, approximately 29 euros. Uh, so in, in, in a good case we can have uh, 100, 130 euro per hectare uh, and that can help to move uh, more farmers to conservation agriculture. Uh, so I, I'm looking into the future for a, a higher uh, CO2 price that would even make it better. So that's the best way to make a business out of it instead of state support or things like that. That is, that is not a good thing. Let the market help if we can do some climate uh, preparations. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Soren. Um, I would like to know if any of the other speakers any has uh, any question because we don't have more questions in our platform. Are you being shy? <laughs> if I may, I can add you some more information. Yeah, I have a question as well. Um, 
I, I would like to ask uh, Marie Soleil a question. Um, RS was very active uh, in promotion of conservation agriculture some years back, but um, it seems to go like uh, with the fashion of the day um, that uh, currently conservation agriculture is sort of um, not important anymore and uh, people focus on improved seed or wash or whatever uh, CRS does. Uh, how do we maintain a longer term uh, vision and a longer term support in an NGO like uh, the Catholic Relief Service um, so that uh, the longer term benefits of conservation agriculture can really um, be harvested somehow? Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, I think um, we started to touch on that in the previous question about scaling and I think um, you know, in this uh, in this the last pro program that we've been working on the last five years in Central America, um, we've taken this shift from uh, working, you know, as an independent NGO and then actually now working more as a catalyst of this uh, systems change. So um, m moving the focus to working very closely with permanent actors and local governments to um, influence the incorporation of CA into education and extension and um, and policies and programs to have that long-term sustainability um, beyond just one CRS project. Um, so, you know, this is key and, and, you know, we're already seeing all the, the different collaborators that we've been working with. Um, they're continuing on with now their own programs focused on CA or water smart agriculture practices, incorporating that into their permanent um, education and programs. And, and so it's, it's really starting to, to take hold in the region. And I think this is, you know, this is something we're learning as an institution. Um, and, and the, the, this is the approach now now that it's being taken in in the parts of the world where you're working also in our programs in Africa. So this uh, more uh, role of catalyzing that change um, for, for long term impact. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I can see that Telmo Amadou has uh, a question. Please go on. Yes. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, my question is to Ivo Melo. Uh, how, in your point of view, uh, how is the possibility to scaling up the good results from Itaipu to other done around the world? Thank you, my professor, for the question. <laughs> yes, we, uh, you know that the, 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 this approach is um, transfer for, for example, for the, the dam in uh, the, between the Uruguay and Argentina and uh, uh, the Salto Dam, they have a, a same approach, and then they are they they learned from Itaipu experience, and they are uh, uh, experimented in there. But uh, you know that we have and um, with Embrapa and uh, Itaipu and uh, our Brazilian uh, Federation of No Two Farmers Association, we have the the project the um, uh, uh, an approach that is uh, trying to uh, adapt for other watersheds in Brazil, and this is a Solo Vivo project in Embrapa. And this uh, is the, the, the primary results are available, but um, we have to um, adapt in other regions because this, uh, this approach, you know, because you, you were with us in, in the very beginning and, uh, and uh, this is this approach in uh, uh, Panana tree watershed is for Paraná tree watershed, it's for management that uh, in this region, in this uh, crop rotation and, and all, and all uh, issues. And then we are uh, trying to, we have an, an, an experience that uh, I will in charge, I, I am in charge in our region in Rio Grande do Sul state to adapt the 
uh, IKP, the IKP for water management in rice. And then, um, well, we have many challenges and uh, we hope we can reach the goals that, uh, and and talking about the, the, the ecosystem services uh, payments that, that uh, I asked for our other professor, Don Rekoski, um, we have now an, a new regulation, new laws in Brazil it's from the beginning of this year or the end of 2020. And uh, that is uh, to improve uh, uh, payments for uh, ecosystem services. And then we are very uh, uh, hopeful that uh, we will have news in the, the future to pay English to pay because we learn uh, about the, the, the payments in, in Europe and in US and in our country, in our continent. We don't have a uh, payment for uh, ecosystem service provided by uh, no two farmers. Thank you. Thank you. We're almost uh, finished. I would like to ask any of the speakers one question and you will have to answer with one sentence which is which is the main the main difficulty that farmers uh, tell you for not uh, doing conservation agriculture so Ivo Melo, can you start please i'll start on by the um, the lock uh, direction well this is the the main uh, Difficult is the the market right? because they they argument that uh, they have to 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 grow to grow to crop soybean and then this is difficult to improve the crop rotations. Okay, Soren. I would say that uh, farmers here are very uh, focused on yield. We have very high winter wheat yields up to twelve tons per hectare, and they have heard from agronomists that they will lose yield if they go no tilling. So so we have to prove that uh, it can be done and uh, it's only by examples we can show it. Uh, so it takes time. But but conventional farmers are uh, thinking more of yield instead of bottom line and uh, net net income. Uh, Marie, can you tell us what farmers tell you that it's the main difficulty they have to, to accept uh, conservation agriculture? Um, some of the main challenges would be just having that technical support, um, uh, producing enough residues to maintain their uh, their soil covered. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I think those trade offs with uh, other residue use are our main uh, challenge also. Okay, uh, Juliana. Okay, so I agree with Marie. The well, the, the lack of uh, support uh, is the, one of the things I've heard more. And in addition, the, there's um, since it is a, a paradigm uh, change or a cultural change, it can take time. So you need to be patient and um, let farmers know that there are alternatives. Okay, Thelmo, can you tell us? Anything yeah. about that? Yes, um, I think that um, uh, our farmers are too much yield oriented. So, and they try to, to make things easy. Uh, so, and conservation agriculture sometimes uh, need more attention, need more careful observation and uh, farmers sometimes just want to make this as simple as possible. But maybe Soren uh, could help us to, to provide that the risk uh, is much lower than the conservation agriculture. So conservation agriculture is a climate smart agriculture and we can't uh, have a high risk as conventional agriculture uh, put us because the draw and other uh, weather events. Thank you, Thelmo. 
uh, Christian? Well, you ask a very difficult question, which is very difficult to answer in one sentence. Um, I think I could talk about that for an hour, <laughs> because in our case, it is really challenging. When you live on a hectare uh, on average land, um, you have to feed a family of six up to 12. Um, your yields are generally much lower because your fertilizer use is, is 17 kgs per hectare. Um, then uh, farmers are really dependent on short-term short gains and they cannot wait for long-term sustainability. That uh, is one of the main reasons why farmers are not immediately adopting it. But there are also cultural barriers. Farmers um, who have learned farming from their fathers and forefathers and they were telling them you have to till your land to be a productive farmer uh, cannot easily change to no tillage. So I agree with all the speakers uh, that have said, you need to show them the, the opposite. And that needs patience and needs a lot of stamina as well. I have been in Southern Africa for 17 years now. I have seen it uh, rising from no uh, CA to maybe a million farmers doing CA. And um, it is a long-term process and needs a long-term patience as well. That's okay. what I would uh, answer. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I will meet you one day. Uh, I'll put on the chat my contact if you by any chance would like to contact in my uh, association in Portugal. Uh, I would like to thank Don too. I would like to thank the organization, the excellent organization of this uh, Congress, uh, ECAF, FAO, and the Swiss No Till. Um, and I wish you all, all the best in your professional and personal projects and stay safe. And I hope this uh, pandemic situation will end soon. So see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.